This is obviously true. A thought about a vacation in Copenhagen, that sounds nice, could not have been the same thought if it were about Chernobyl instead, right? You know, luggage got lost or something, bad flight, I don't know, ended up in Chernobyl instead. What's the difference? Uh, I'd say quite a bit, right? But in other words, that what thought it is depends on that content. You change the content, it's just a different thought. So this is, this is quite important. Now, Scott Smith makes an argument here. I think I'm going to skip this in the interest of time. Basically, what he, he gives is um, an argument as to why you need a soul for knowledge. I don't really have the time to cover that because I think I want to leave some time for some questions. So I'm going to skip, skip that. It's an important argument. And it's you should all have accessibility to the PowerPoint because I sent them. Will they have that? Yeah. OK. Yeah. So if you want to ask me about that, what I'd like to do, though, Assuming that we have shown that the main arguments against souls are not successful, we don't have to uh, reject the idea of soul. Uh, I was also asked to comment on this, which is, why well, think there's a connection between the nature of the soul and God? You expect there is, because people have noticed that the soul is rather like God. When we think about being made in the image of God, well, God doesn't require a body to exist. He's a pure immaterial being. And the soul seems to be something of that kind. And so many philosophers have argued that the existence of finite souls like you and I have, surely, if we can show that they do exist, provides a good argument for the existence of God, because it's not the kind of thing that you would expect at all, given a materialist view. In fact, materialists are adamant in denying the existence of the soul. So here's some arguments, the argument from consciousness, the argument from reason, the argument from moral norms. I may not be able to get through all of these, so I'll just see how we go here. Um, the argument from consciousness points out that two features of consciousness seem to point to the existence of God. One is that consciousness is personal. Uh, you can't imagine, in, in the idea of impersonal consciousness does not make sense. To be aware is always to be aware from a particular point of view. Consciousness is always someone's consciousness. And also the consciousness is simple. Now here's how these arguments go. Um, if you think about materialism, it says that it's, it's a matter first view. In the beginning, you just have blind, impersonal processes. They not only do not explain conscious subjects, that's the so-called hard problem of consciousness, they don't even really predict it or suggest it. And, and Thomas Nagel, by the way, agrees with that in his book, Mind and Cosmos. And we noticed that distinction at the beginning. Material objects are these aggregates of separable parts, but thoughts are intrinsically subjective and inseparable from thinkers. There's a big logical gap between this kind of thing and that kind of thing. This leads to J.P. Morland's argument. He gives this in Consciousness and the Existence of God, 2008, and also in the Recalcitrant Imago Day in uh, 2009. <clears throat> Premise, Gen genuine non-physical mental states exist. Okay, they're not physical and they're mental states like beliefs and desires and uh, conscious perceptions of color and feeling pain, and all those kinds of things. There is an explanation for those. <clears throat> now why? Well, if something is completely unexpected, yet it is also contingent, there is no necessity in it arising, then it requires an explanation. This is why Nagel talks about phenomena which are remarkable. He doesn't mean subjectively remarkable. They're remarkable in that they clearly exist and they're not predicted by materialism. And so there has to be an explanation for them. For a materialist to simply say um, they're brute facts would be philosophical cheating. It's like getting out your philosophical credit card and, and saying, well, I, you know, we can have that with not really any explanation. So, there is an explanation. Personal explanation is different from natural scientific explanation. 
In other words, a personal explanation is like uh, you went to the movies because you believed that was the best movie and you wanted to see it. The explanation will uh, refer to your personal reasons, your beliefs, desires, and intentions. That's obviously very different from natural scientific explanation, which simply says this system was in this state and that caused it to go into this state. Okay, so those two kinds of explanation are different. The explanation for the existence of mental states has to be either personal or impersonal because that's a mutually exclusive set of options and exhaustive, it's one or the other. Um, Note, the explanation is not impersonal. This is the, the Sudbury Ha problem of consciousness that David Chalmers made famous. Because nothing about the impersonal processes studied by any natural science, physics, chemistry, biology, explains, predicts, or even suggests the emergence of consciousness. That is particular subjective points of view. Because you can do all that science all day long, and it never in any way requires the existence of a point of view in the world. So if it's not impersonal, therefore the explanation is personal. And so R, ah, then the existence of mental states requires a personal explanation. That would have to be in terms of the beliefs and desires and intentions of another mental subject, not a human one. And that, of course, then takes us to God. If the explanation is personal, then it's theistic. And to avoid a regress, it would need to be a necessary person with aseity, self-existence. Because otherwise you could say, well, why does that exist, right, and so forth. And that would then explain the origin of contingent, intrinsically personal states, why we have uh, consciousness. Therefore, the explanation is theistic. That's a powerful, powerful uh, argument from our consciousness, from our soul, to God's uh, existence. Um, also, the simplicity of consciousness, as we notice, Consciousness is a unity of inseparable parts. All of your thoughts and experience are tied to you, to one whole. So consciousness cannot be composed from a complex aggregate of parts. And therefore that again argues that contingent consciousness has to arise from another consciousness. Since it can't come from anything physical by rearranging it, it seems to require um, a necessary consciousness to explain it. Then I'll comment briefly on this, the argument from reason. Naturalism predicts unreliable minds, but theism predicts reliable minds, and therefore theism best explains the reliability of human reason, which science presupposes, and so does materialism, because it claims you should be a materialist because of scientific discoveries. So it has to uh, advocate the reliability uh, of human reason. Here's the interesting thing. When you read the leading evolutionary psychologists, they concede the point. Stephen Pinker, our brains were shaped for fitness, not for truth. Because what matters is that your body survives, that you avoid predators, that you find food, and you reproduce. There's, those are the things that matter from that point of view, not whether your beliefs are true. Uh, Lewis Walpott from uh, London University, same thing. Our brains contain a belief-generating machine that can produce beliefs with little relation to what is actually true. Truth will take the hindmost, as Patricia Churchill famously uh, said. Theism, though, predicts reliable minds. Well, why? Because it does not claim that reason is something that emerged mysteriously from the physical. Reason always existed in the mind of God. Reason, therefore, is not the kind of thing that has to be explained as a fortuitous adaptation. Right? Our reason, in fact, to the degree that we can reason, it is because we are illuminated by divine reason. This also explains why we can understand nature. Because the same logos in the mind of God is reflected both in nature and in the human mind. And that, therefore, predicts that the human mind is attuned to the kind of reason in the laws of nature. So it's no surprise then that great scientific discoveries are possible, that we can discover at least approximations. And of course, our finitude and sin would predict that it's not going to be perfect, but we can at least discover approximations to laws of uh, nature. 
There's a picture of that, right? So since that reason, the divine logos is the same, reflected in both the laws of nature and human reason, there would be an affinity here because they both come from the same source. Otherwise, you might have a horrible situation where we naturally think in French, but the laws of nature are in German, or something like this, and that would be very irritating, a little concerned. Okay. Um, all right, I'll quickly comment on this. The, the argument for moral norms, souls can grasp objective moral norms, um, things that hold of normative uh, necessity. Um, this requires more argument than I can give here. But notice that when you look at the moral demand, it cannot arise just from the contingent interactions of an individual or species with the environment. If you see that something is rationally required, if you accept the idea, for example, that there are universal human rights, they, they are applied to all human beings, and they are not limited to the kind of historical interactions that we have had with the environment. They're, they're universal, and they are necessary and don't arise from nature. And it seems that to explain <coughs> our grasp of those kind of moral norms is much like what Lewis says about logic in miracles. That something he says must be able to break free from the contingent natural order to see things which hold of necessity. All right, so when you, for example, go through this reasoning, you see this conclusion is necessarily true in all possible worlds. It's not that it's kind of worked in my experience. Or for most human beings, it's true. Nobody thinks that, right? If you understand this, you know it must be true uh, in the past, in the future, and even in other possible universes, which obviously we have not causally interacted with. Um, Craig's moral argument kind of uh, follows on with that. He points out if God doesn't exist, objective moral values and duties do not exist argues that they do exist and therefore that, that God exists. Um, I think though, I want to give you guys some time for questions, so I'm not going to go through all of this. I'll stop here and uh, ask for some com comments and questions.